Welcome. We're glad you're here tonight. And glad those that are joining us online too are with us. Uh, this is the last night of, of our uh, summer series, and, and I think uh, we've just had a, a very special summer with, with some terrific lessons that our uh, speakers have brought. And uh, as we usually try to do, we try to get Harley to wind us up for the summer. So uh, Harley's here tonight, Harley Davidson from Western Hills uh, in Lawton, and uh, we look forward to his lesson uh, in a little bit, and uh, we're going to be led in our singing tonight by, by Mike Moss. So again, we're, we're glad you're here. As uh, Again, uh, we look at another Jesus encounter, this one with uh, the Canaanite woman. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mike at this time, and then in a little bit, uh, we, we'll turn it over to Harley. Good evening, everyone. Our first song is Salvation Belongs to Our God. Would you stand, please? Salvation belongs to our God, who sits upon the throne, and unto the Lamb be praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honor and power and strength, be to our God forever. man hanging in pain 
seen the look of love in his eyes, then I say, you seen Jesus my Lord. Have you seen Jesus my Lord? He's here in plain view. Take a look, open your eyes. He'll show it to you. Have you ever stood in the family with the Lord there in your midst, seen the face of Christ on each other? Then I say, you've seen Jesus my Lord. Have you seen Jesus my Lord? He's here in plain view. Take a look, open your eyes, he'll show it to you. I'd like to ask Stan to lead us in a word of prayer now, please. Father, we come before you this hour. We thank you for all the blessings you've given to us. And we're especially thankful for coming together here in another portion of your word and we pray that brother harley will teach us a good a lesson on um, on an encounter that especially if we look at it with with open eyes that we know that these encounters are are people just like us that the lessons are individual that we should take those and live them in our lives and think on them and and, and think of those think of those encounters as um as blessings to us in today society we uh, pray for those throughout the world that are in distress at this time whether it be from flooding or war or those that uh, that are involved in in uh, in those sort of things that we we pray that your blessings would be upon them and and you would um, be with them we pray for our governments throughout the world we pray that peace may come we especially pray for those in Ukraine and uh, those that are in war at this time. We uh, also now we'd like to pray for those that are not feeling well. We're uh, thankful that uh, Babs and uh, her results from her test and, and we pray for Corey and, and uh, his struggles. We pray for Ann and, and we pray for those for healing in, in those cases and we would pray for each one of those to, to return to their health. We'd ask you now to watch over us and be with Brother Harley and be with each one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. I guess that microphone's just going to do what it's going to do. Um, if we were to have an invitation song tonight, or if we were to have a closing song tonight, this song would be it. Um, we've had uh, studies on encounters with Jesus for June, July, and August, for three months. So the question comes to us, I think, really each day, what will you do with Jesus? With your encounter with Jesus, what will you do? How will you respond? Uh, the verses of this song, Jesus is standing in Pilate's hall, friendless, forsaken, betrayed by all. Hearken, what meaneth the sudden call? What will you do with Jesus? Jesus is standing on trial still. You can be false to him, if you will. You can be faithful through good or ill. What will you do with Jesus? Will you evade him as Pilate tried? Or will you choose him, whatever be tied? Vainly you struggle from him to hide. What will you do with Jesus? And then there's the fourth verse. We'll sing all four verses. Jesus is standing in Pilate's hall, friendless, forsaken, betrayed by all. Hearken what meaneth the sudden call. What will you do with Jesus? What 
will you do with Jesus, my friend? Neutral you cannot be. Someday your heart will be asking, my friend, what will he do with me? Jesus is standing on trial still. You can be false to him if you will. You can be faithful through good or ill. What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus, my friend? Neutral you cannot be. Someday your heart will be asking, oh friend, what will he do with me? Will you evade him as Pilate tried? Or will you choose him whatever be tied? Vainly you struggle from him to hide. What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus, my friend? Neutral you cannot be. Someday your heart will be asking, oh friend, what will he do with me? Jesus, I give thee my heart today. Jesus, I'll follow thee all the way. Gladly obeying thee will you say, this will I do with Jesus. What will you do with Jesus, my friend? Neutral you cannot be. Someday your heart will be asking, oh friend, what will he do? Well, good evening, church. The brother asked why this mic was doing that. It's because I'm so short. They adjusted it just for me. God is good, amen? amen. God is good, amen? amen? This side's a little louder than that side, so amen? Amen? amen. amen. Uh, very good. Just want to make sure you're still an amen church, because I'm an amen preacher. That means I keep going if you see, keep saying amen. All right. God is a good, good God. It's good to be back with you again. It's good that, uh, you know, all this pandemic, whatever this stuff has been, is kind of just, and we just praise God for that. Pray that you're doing well in your family. Thank you, the audience, for being here tonight. Thank you, church, for allowing me to come and speak for you again. Uh, I want to thank the elders for <laughs> taking a risk again. <laughs> and for Leonard, Leonard has uh, been a great friend of mine for many years, even before I came, Don and I came to Lawton actually uh, many years ago, and I've known him for probably 33 years now. Um, we've, we're working on our 30th year, and I think Leonard's probably working on, what, 75 here? Okay. That's about right, ain't it? A amen, somebody said, see, I'm going to keep preaching. <laughs> and, uh, but he's, he, he's, he's great, and we love him much. Yeah, we love him so much, and I know he's doing a great work. Um, my bride, Donna, is with me tonight. Always good to have her. She's retired now. She started working when she was 12, but she's retired now. And I'm thankful that she can travel with me when I get a chance to go places and speak. And I love to do that. I love to talk about my Lord. I love to talk about my family and two of my favorite subjects. And, uh, but I want to talk to you tonight because you're family. Again, thank you for having me. There was this frog that was absolutely confident that he was going to turn into this beautiful prince. This frog was so confident that that's just what his destiny was, to be this wonderful, beautiful prince. But to make sure that that was going to happen and to make sure that it was to come about, he went to a fortune teller. So he goes to the fortune teller and they set him down and they look in this big globe there and, you know, whatever, crystal ball, and he begins to say, and the, the fortune teller says, oh, I see something great in your life's about to happen. Oh, the frog was just so happy, ribbit, ribbit. He was just excited about that. 
and he says, oh, I see this beautiful woman that's coming into your life. Oh, man, I just knew that I was going to be this handsome prince someday. And when she looks at you, I promise she will never take her eyes off of you. She will be glued to you because you are just, you just fascinate her from head to toe. You just fascinate her. He's like, oh, man, this is just wonderful. He said, oh, please tell me, where am I? Am I in a singles club? And the fortune teller said, oh, no, you're in a biology class. <laughs> there is within each of us and I want to tell you first of all I wrote this message three times so if you want the next two you're going to have to invite me back two more times and you can ask Donna I, 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 I just I wanted it to be right for its writing in God's word I wanted it to be Right, not that you would go away and say, wow. I wanted to do the scripture that I've been given tonight some type of justice that it deserves. There is within each of us this longing to be useful. And in these encounters that we have with God allows us to do that, I think. We've been saved for a purpose in the kingdom of God. Can I have an amen? There is a reason why you have been saved. It's not to sit in a pew and be fed like a little bird in a nest. There's a purpose connected to it. And it's something within us, I think, this innate thing that comes within us that allows us to know that we, or desire within us to be something bigger than what we are. So we have church, bigger than what we are. To belong to something that makes a difference in a world that has gone mad. To make a difference that my dash in life makes a difference in the lives of people. Worthwhile. And as Christians, that is what we should have a burning desire to do as we're called to go into the world. And we all know that we're called to go into the world with Jesus. God's desire is that every one of his children would discover their destiny. I believe that. Now, we know our final destiny is heaven. Give me an amen. That's pretty weak. I'm going to heaven. Anybody going? All right. So we should be glad. We should be happy. We should be thankful. We should be rejoicing because we are on our way home, and it's a place called heaven. Give me an amen. All right. Very good. I believe that God has this within us, or we long to have, or God wants us to have this destiny of the good plans that He has prepared for us, Jeremiah 20 and 11. And I want to receive every single one of those, not that I'm greedy, but I am a child of God. And that if God wants them for me, I want them for me. Because if I get what God wants, I know I'm going to live a life that's going to make a difference in the life of someone else, my family and friends. When God calls us out of the darkness, when God calls us out of darkness into His light, there's always a purpose behind it. Never forget that. There's a purpose why you're here. There's a purpose for the time in which you were born. It's designed by God. He had you for this moment in time. And this is it. This is time for you to shine. Time for us as God's children so that the next generation that comes behind us, they can simply say, they did not let us down. They stood firm in the faith of Almighty God. The starting point of that is an encounter with God where it happens in our life. To hear His call in your life. Have you heard the call of God in your life? If you're a child of God, I promise you, you did. Because you don't know when it was. Maybe you didn't plan it. Maybe you were at a camp. Maybe you were at a, at a revival. Maybe you were at just a church setting. Or maybe you were at 2 o'clock in the morning and you couldn't sleep. But there was a call in your life and you said yes to God. That's an encounter. We have encounters with God. My mom used to tell me all the time growing up, Son, pay attention today. You might learn something. There were a lot of days I didn't pay attention. And the older I get, I try to pay more attention to two people. God, and of course, my bride. It's important 
that we have those encounters. And I believe God has those for us in our lives. We might hear the audible voice of God. I don't know that I've heard God say, Harley, it's your turn. No, I haven't heard that. But I believe my God still speaks. And He speaks within the spirit of us that God has placed within us when we experience the new birth and we claim Him as Lord and Savior. He said, I'm going to put something in you and that something I'm putting in you is my DNA. And I will speak to your spirit and I will give you the words to say and I will give you the movement to make and I will give you your destiny. I will give you a purpose in your life if you let me. And we are to walk with the Lord in faith and obedience. Then, and only then, does our life become worthy of the call that we have by God. Throughout the summer, I'm sure that you have been challenged by some of awesome speakers. I saw your lineup, and Leonard always does a great job of getting the right people in the right places. And I'll try not to mess it up tonight. So let's take a look at the story that I've been called to look at tonight in Matthew chapter 15. You can put the scripture up, and there you see it, and I hope you can read that. If not, maybe you have your electronic devices, and we can look at those together, the scripture. I want us to look at this scripture tonight and discover and then see how, if it's somehow we can make it applicable to our lives. Because if we cannot do that with the Word of God, any word in His any story that you find in the Word of God, if you can't make it something that is for your life, then you're missing its purpose in there. Then why is it there? There are only so many stories that God said, I want this one in, and this is the one that He wanted in right here. He said, that's where I want it, and that's what I want taught. And we're going to look at it. Can I have an amen? Would you all stand for the reading of the Word of God? Please do that. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. The Canaanite woman from the vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering, suffering terribly from the demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him, Lord, help me. He replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, you're right. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. And the church said, and the preacher said, have a seat. It is a story of faith, but it is a story of faith, a faith challenge to you and to me. And the more I read this, the more the nuggets just pop off the page. And I pray, if nothing else, that you've read the scripture again tonight as the brother prayed in his prayer, and I thank you for that, that we might just see what it is that would God have us to see. When's the last time you asked God, God, let me just see what you want me to see in this moment? Let's pray. Father, that's what my prayer is, as my brother said a few moments ago, and that's my request as well, is the Lord help us to see what you would have us to see to hear what you would have us to hear and become what you want us to be. We welcome you, Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. As you look at this scripture, I only have four um, screens for you tonight. But as you look at this scripture here, I find it, wouldn't it be awesome if we could have this kind of encounter with Jesus in our life? And I believe the more I read this story, I believe that this story is the one that allows us to say and assures us that we can have that encounter with God. Now, I know the theme of this year, and I wrote it down here so that I wouldn't be wrong. The theme that I was given, or was given this year for these three months that you've been studying is to learn from Jesus and how to encounter people in a way that will expand the trail to the cross. It's a great theme. And I'm sure that you have been directed in, in how to do that in these great messages that you've heard over the past several weeks together. However, if you and I don't get this one thing right, 
our witness, our witness becomes shallow in the world that's in a drought like it's never seen before. Our world is in a mess. You know it and I know it and the world keeps turning in that mess. And our challenge is to go into the world and make a difference in a messed up world. God must have a great faith in us to allow us to be in this time of history. Those of us that are old, I'm 65, and those of us that are old enough, we could kind of back up 30 years and we go, man, that was some good times. Things pretty smooth, things running really good. And then what the heck happened in the last five or six years? The world's gone mad. But you know what excites me about this time? Is that God trusts me in it. God trusts me to be able to do something that I think I can't do. And that excites me because that takes faith. You see, if it just rolled along smooth silk way before the pandemic and everything was fine, you know, oh man, everything was just great. I didn't have to put much work in. I didn't have to put much effort in to studying His Word or teaching His Word or trying to be the light when I just want to burn somebody's light out. I'm so thankful and I'm excited about that because I believe there's a great harvest waiting I believe the harvest that Jesus talked about, the fields are ripe with har harvest, I believe they're ready. I believe it's the wheat farmer that's looking at a field that's just ripe. And in this part of the country, I think maybe 30 bushels to an acre is pretty good. Anybody? Maybe 35? I'm thinking 100 bushels per acre. Can I get an amen? Wouldn't that be awesome? What do you think that farmer would set on his combine that day when he looked out in that field of thousand acres or thousands of acres and he knew that there were a hundred bushels per acre for the picking? Do you think he'd turn his combine off and go to the house? Well, a little, uh, I think I might go on a vacation. I don't think so. He would call in his friends, his neighbors. He'd call some extra combines in because he knows it's a bumper crop. I believe there's a bumper crop right outside those doors. And we got plenty of seats for him. Can I have an amen? Amen. I don't know where I'm at in the middle of this, but we'll keep on going anyway until we figure up the time. Somebody's got to tell me. Back to the story. I find it interesting in this story that Jesus ignores this woman. It's as though she's not even there. It's as though she hasn't even said a word. Did you see that encounter? What encounter? He didn't even talk to me. He just ignored me. And then instead of her saying, excuse me, I'm talking here, the disciples cut in and they simply say, hey, she's bugging us. Send her home. That's an interesting story in and of itself, is it not? Hey, just send that one home. So was the story about her or was the story about the disciples? Well, I would declare to you tonight it was about both, but it's actually about a third and fourth party that you may not even know. But we might discover together. So he answered, as you see there in 24, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Now we can go into the history and look at all that stuff and all, all that others. But this lady's there. It's her moment. And then the woman came back and he knelt before him and she, she narrows her request down. Notice what she does. She says, Lord, help me. Anybody ever say that? Anybody ever just, just say that in life? Because this woman knew that her answer was, in, answer was in front of her and she was determined. She was determined not to leave without it while the disciples were fine with her and her daughter leaving with the demon that they came with. How sad. You see, it was her demon as well. Oh, yes, it was. You have a child? You have grandchildren? And when they go through something, you go through it. When they go through a divorce, it affects you. 
when they go through struggles and bullying or whatever terms you want to use, financial problems, marital problems, whatever they go through, health problems, I guarantee you, you go through that too. When there's health problems in the family, you go through that. This woman went through that. Where's the husband? Did he leave? I don't know. I'm sure there were a lot of people that said a lot of things about this young lady because she was demoned possessed and mama held her tight when she was having one of those fits it was hers as well as her daughter's her request was lord help swindoll said it best i think he said one of the greatest prayers that a person can have is just one word help do you know why Because God knows the heart behind help. Anybody been there but me? Their response was, Lord, get rid of her. One with faith, others with sight. And I say sight on purpose because I want to use a baseball metaphor maybe here. I say sight because the disciples could see at this point perhaps that Jesus was apparently not on his A game that day. And so what they were feeling in their their lives was he's not on his A game and none of us felt like we could come out of the bullpen and do any better. So why don't you just call the game today, Lord? And be sure this one doesn't get in the book so that no one will find out about it. But here it is. In plain view. It's in plain view for all generations and ours as well to read and to study and to dissect. The ones that were called by the master hand selected by Jesus himself that could have, should have showed us what great faith was could only show us that they were human too. And yet the one that seems to be a throwaway displays Something that we are all still amazed with some 2,000 years later and we still don't even have her name. I, I often wonder of these people in heavens, heaven that had no names connected with them. And they're, they're listening to us talk about, and maybe she's saying, he's talking about me. She's got her daughter there and She's talking about me. That's me in that story. They're talk- At Chisholm Trail tonight, they're talking about me. They don't even know my name. But Jesus did. I, I find it interesting. I think there are no named people in Scripture stories often in order that we might place ourselves there. That we might place ourselves there. The woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery, the man that was paralyzed. We find ourselves at the well needing to drink, do we not? In our lives, when our lives cave in? Surely we do. We find ourselves needing that. When we get caught in the act of sin and forgiveness seems to be so far away that no one will forgive us, we find ourselves paralyzed by the pain of life that we're going through. The disease that we have been diagnosed with that appears for all intents and purposes is the end. You see, in those moments in our lives, these stories come alive for us. They come alive for us, and they are a blessing to us so that we might find the God that touched them, find the God that spoke to them, find the God that healed them, find the God that forgave them, the find the God that touched them when no one else would. Without Jesus in this story, the story ends pretty ugly. And I want to tell you tonight, without Jesus in your life, your story is going to end pretty ugly as well. But if you have Jesus in your life, somebody ought to shout amen. Because my story has already been written. And Jesus paid the price. Can I have an amen? All right. An amazing thing about this woman was, once again, she was willing to go. She knew where she needed to be 
because her hunger brought her to the feet of Jesus. It was so great that she was determined to do whatever it took. Now get this, she was determined to do whatever it took, even if it was a crumb. She was willing to take it. Because she was convinced and believed in her heart that that would be more than enough for her. So determined, I might add, that Jesus makes a statement in Scripture that He rarely ever makes just very few times at all, and that is, you have great faith. Write it down. You will never receive what your faith is unwilling to release. You will never receive what your faith is unwilling to release. You can't even receive salvation unless you're willing to release your faith that Jesus died for you. You say, okay, Harley, where are you at in the midst of this? Somebody give me a time. I don't want to go over because I want to make sure I get to the end of this. Is there a... I got two minutes left? Oh, I was going to say, man... (laughs) Okay, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's good. Laughter is good medicine. All right. You say, good for her, but what about me? Because that's what we need to talk about. Because you can read the story and say, whoo good for her, man. Canaanite woman, hey, let's go home, get some ice cream. Leonard's buying. But it ain't going to work. What has God said about your faith? You ever ask yourself, God, what are you saying about my faith today? That's some crickets, isn't it? I've come to remind all of us tonight that your faith is on display, not only for your family to see, immediate family, and your church family, but for the world to see. And if you and I live in a land of little faith, we can't expect to attract, be attractive for others to want what we say we have. You see, if we say what we have, which is eternal life, give me an amen, <laughs> then we should have the greatest faith that ever walked planet Earth. Because once you understand that you're saved, once you understand that, well, I hope so, don't insult what Jesus did on the cross. Once you understand you're saved, You're saying, God, I believe that you're going to raise me from the dead someday. And in that, if you believe that, then don't, how can you not have faith in God taking care of you between now and then? Or Him leading you in a direction? We forget. That's why. We forget. If we stay in the land of the little faith, we can't expect to be attractive. If this woman would have had little faith, she perhaps would have left after the opening act. Jesus said nothing. I'm doomed. Just going home. Come on, Sarah. We're just out here. Nobody cares anymore. Nobody has anything. Hey, don't, this, this guy's a fake just like all the other ones. Come on. I know. I know. If she had little faith, she'd have left when Jesus said nothing. If she had mediocre faith, just a little bit more than a little faith, But not much. If she'd had a mediocre faith, perhaps she would have left after the dog reference. But not this woman. Not this woman. She gave what she had, and it was from her brokenness. And did you know that's what God wants from us? It's our brokenness. Why? Because he's the one that put us together in the first place and he knows what we ought to look like. And so she gives him the brokenness of her heart. It was from her exhausted venture with her daughter. Day after day, week after week, month after month. If you've dealt with individuals like that, it's one thing to go and say, Hey sister, I'll come and sit with him or I'll come and sit with her for an hour or two while you go somewhere. But day after day after day after day, 
whole different story. Anybody been there? Feel free to raise your hand. I have. And it's tough. And you know it is. It was for her. Exhausted venture. It came from an empty vessel that had nothing left except faith in what was standing in front of her. And that's all she needed. And she knew it. She knew it. She was the widow woman standing before Elijah saying, all we got is this piece of bread or maybe this pancake here. We're going to eat it and we're going to die because there's nothing left. She was the woman with the bleeding issue for 12 years that had nothing left in her bank account except a withered, anemic body. She was the man that had leprosy and lost not only not only his health, but his entire community, friends, and family. In my book, she's listed among the greats because she believed what she could not see was already seen and known by the one she knew as Lord. She said in her heart what David said in the Psalms, my help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. She says, if, if, you, if I believe that you made the heaven and the earth, do you believe that God made the heaven and the earth? And so she says, I believe that you made the heaven and the earth as David had written long a time ago. If I believe that you did that, I believe you can speak the word and my daughter will be healed. Because you're no less God then than you are now. And let me tell you, my friend, he is no less God today than he was then. He is God. He is our helper. In my broken heart can be mended. My broken heart, my pain of agony can subside. My help comes from the Lord. We should sing. Where does your help come from? Sister, right out of the hospital just today, apparently. Where's your help come from? Ask her. She'll have a word for you tonight. Her help comes from the Lord. And those of you that were praying, you, you know, when, when you're sick or you're in a hospital, what do you want people to do for you? There's probably one, two things, probably two things. I found out this out as a minister, Leonard. If, if you're in the hospital and you're sick, sick, you want two things. You don't want people to come visit you. <laughs> throwing up, got a pee cup over here. You know what I'm saying, right? Everybody shake up and down. That still means yes on Wednesday nights, right? You, so you don't want people there, but you want people that believe in prayer. You don't believe in prayer, I'm not asking you. So you find people that believe in prayer and you connect with them and you know who your prayer warriors are because I'm telling you, there's something about prayer that moves God because my God can do whatever God chooses to do and if I'm a child of God and He says I can talk with Him and I can have faith in Him, He says if you'll ask and not have unbelief but belief, it shall be done. Two or three come into agreement. Hey, will you come into an agreement with me that I will be well? That's what I want. Well, I prayed one of those and the person didn't make it. If they were a Christian, they made it. They made it home. Praise God. Where does your help come from? The world is telling you and I to go away. We are bugging them. You know that, don't you? I'm sure somebody in this room has watched the news. The world is telling us to go away. We are bugging them. Our agenda does not meet their objective. And we have a choice. Try to move through this as quickly as I can, but I think this is important. We have a choice. Statistics are telling us now that churches are dying. They are in a major decline. It's happening. But again, I believe the harvest is plentiful because I believe my God is true over what the world is trying to tell us. We have a choice. We can slip into the back door and be silent as the world tells us we must be 
and continue down the road until we drift into state, a state of obscurity? Or, and I like that or in there. Or we can be people of great faith to stand in that faith and show a world that our God is an awesome God. Our God is alive. Our God is real. Our God listens to us. And we are victorious in Jesus Christ. Give me an amen. I believe that with all my heart. I wouldn't preach it. We are children of the Most High God. We offer truth, and the truth is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That Jesus saves, that Jesus heals, that Jesus heals the brokenhearted, that J Jesus delivers a lasting peace and hope that the world knows nothing of. The world tells our world today, pick what gender you want and you will find peace. You will not find peace until you find Jesus Christ and your sins are removed. We have the message of hope. We have the message of truth. We have the message that will save lives from hell. While the world teaches people how to go. Friends, we are children of God, and it's time that we let the world know who we are. Jeff Walling said, I, I, when I was a youth minister down in Wichita Falls, I had him come in one year, and I, I'll never forget what he said. He said, it's time that we take back what Satan has stolen from us. God's counting on us. Last week, we, we, we were, we've been watching some series of messages out of um, uh, different colleges for their s seminars and things like that over the summer. And Rick actually happened to be one of the speakers. I don't know if you like him or not, whatever the case is. He made this statement last week, and it was powerful. We wrote it down. My wife got it, gave it to me. He said, the church is declining not because we are living secretly sinful lives. You're not leave, living a secret sinful life, are you? I pray not. Oh, no, not me. I'm here. So the church is not declining, not because we are living secretly sinful lives. It is declining because we are living secretly Christian lives. If you are not sold on Jesus, you cannot sell him to anyone else. And sad to say, many, many have. How many minutes? Tell me. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'll go on this thing down. If I was selling vacuum cleaners and I came to your house, and let's say I was selling Electrolux. I don't even know if they sell those anymore. But I remember lugging one around. But anyway, Electrolux. And I came to your house and I said, uh, could I show you this vacuum cleaner? And you came in and you said, sure. So I come in and I show you all the attachments, show you, oh, this thing's great, this is wonderful, thing. suck the carpet off the floor, whatever, and do all that stuff. And you asked me one question. And your question was, what kind of vacuum cleaner do you have at home? And I said, oh, I don't have one of these. I got a Hoover over here. What are you thinking? He's not sold on his product. You see, what we have to be is we have to be sold on the product that we have. We have the best product that ever has been. His name is Jesus. If you're not sold on Jesus, you can't sell him to anyone else. Your birthright is that you now belong to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Too many Christians are being deceived into believing that faith doesn't work anymore. Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of chicken noodle soup. Is your faith up for sale? Now you know where the title came from. Is your faith up for sale? Before you give up, let me remind you of something. God's love for you has not changed. He will never regret sending his son to save you. You were worth the cost. He has not turned his back on you. 
In 1 John chapter 3, the scripture says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us. You need to change that. See what great love the Father has lavished on me. And that's what I am, a child of God. Look in the mirror tonight before you go to bed. And you look back and you tell that person, I am a child of the Most High God. And God, I praise your name that you chose me. Can I have an amen? Don't be ashamed. Glorify his name. I want you to realize that God has chosen you, my friend. My mom told me a thousand times when I was a little little boy, she said, if you were lined up next to all the little boys in the whole wide world, I would have chosen you. I needed to hear that. Every child does. I really needed to hear it especially since my brother, older brother, told me that the doctor made him bring me home. But anyway, nonetheless, it was the case. Let me put up that last slide. Here's a few more love nuggets from God. That's what I call them. You, you, you can go to Scripture and get a hug anytime you want. You, you, what, let's go up. Yeah, there we go. Here we go. I'm sorry. Apologize. Look at Deuteronomy, and I'm going to read by these quick. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. Out of all the peoples on the face of the earth, the Lord has chosen you to be his treasured people. Oh, someone's saying, yeah, that's Old Testament. I'm treasured. Jesus paid the price for me. I'm treasured by God. Look at the second one. You did not choose me, but I chose you, Jesus said, appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. But God longs to give you what you ask in his name. When you ask, do you ask? And then last one, if you belong to the world, this is good, watch. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. Hallelujah, I don't belong to the world. But I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. The world hates you. It hates you. What they're trying to do to our world and your world and my world is because they hate what we stand for. That's why we got to stand all the more. Give me an amen. We're almost done. i got two minutes. Here we go. So the next time you feel down and out, and you're going to feel that way someday, remember who chose you, God. Stephen Brown wrote, take one step. Take the first step. Take the first step. God takes the next and the next and the next and the next, and you'll soon discover that he took the first one, too, because he chose you before the foundations of the world. You matter to God? Does he know he matters to you is the question. Take down the for sale sign. Take it down. Let it go. And you let Satan know that your faith is not for sale. Christians need to say that. Don't you cower down to what the world says. Stand on your faith. Stand on it. And tell people, I have faith that God saves. He is a good, good God. And he will supply all our needs according to Christ or his riches in Christ Jesus. Listen, God understands that we're human. He understands. He understands that you're human, but he knows that we are his children. Well, we need to be reminded that, yes, we are humans, but we are his children, the children of God. He is standing before us longing for our, our faith to rise to a level, I believe, of greatness in our lives, our time. And if we will keep our eyes fixed on Him and not on the things of the world or around us, we shall be victorious as well. And others will be drawn by our faith just as we are intrigued by the no-named woman that was willing to take a crumb and then she discovered the invitation at the master's table. The Lord's table is always open. Hallelujah. You don't have to sit at His feet. He says, come, feast with me at the table of mercy. Moody said it right when he said, God sends no one away except those who are full of themselves. My friend, if you've never called on Jesus in faith, may your hunger for Him in this very moment be the moment in which you can mark in history 
that I believe. That I believe what you say of me. I have faith that the tomb is still empty. And God is still on his throne. And Jesus is coming back again. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for allowing us to sit at your banquet table tonight. Forgive me, forgive me Father, when I fail. I scrounge around for a little crumbs now and then. Forgive me for not having the faith to stand more boldly. Give me the strength, Father. Help me to remember every day that I am your child and you love me. You have not forsaken me and you'll always be with me. That I am chosen by you and I praise your name for that. Bless those that have come tonight, those that have heard this tonight. May they take it and receive it through their spirit, Father. May you speak to them in wonderful, powerful ways, as you, only you can do. Again, I thank you for my church family here at Chisholm Trail and for the presence tonight. May your blessings be on them and their ministries here. In the power of Jesus' name, I believe. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Harley. You, you closed us out tonight in, in a special way, and, and just uh, thank you uh, for that message. Real quickly, next Wednesday night, uh, we are going to go back to kind of a, a fall schedule. But we're going to begin with adults. We're going to have a wow service in here uh, next Wednesday evening uh, during the, while our kids are in the class. The teens will start their class uh, Wednesday night back up upstairs. Early birders, 445 starts next week in 102, Wayne uh, will be teaching. Ecclesiastes will be your study. Uh, for uh, that so next Wednesday night again it's, it's been a good summer uh, it's getting into fall time thank you so much for those that helped us you loaded the stage with those drinks and oatmeal packets and pop tarts for our snack packs well now we've got another challenge you can already see we got a couple bags of Halloween candy up here. So we're, we're, we're getting ready for our trick or trunk coming up, uh, and uh, we're collecting candy already. They've been saying there may be a candy shortage. So uh, do what? We're going to buy it all. So, so let's, uh, let, let, let's get it. I mean, if we don't get enough candy, we'll have to be giving them bar ass hot dogs. And so we. we, we, we we need the candy. <laughs> so so uh, you can begin to help out with it. And we, we always appreciate uh, your, your cooperation with that. Well, let's say a word of prayer and uh, thanksgiving, and then uh, we'll be dismissed. So let's stand together and we'll close. Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for uh, Harley, and thank you for uh, the ministry, and God bless him and the church at Western Hills, and uh, Father, we just thank you for this evening, and reminded how important our faith is, and Father, we again just pray that you'll use us to bring you glory, uh, and especially, Father, uh, in a world where it is white into harvest. And Father, we just thank you for using us uh, for such a time as this. And Father, thank you for your son Jesus and for what he's done for us. And Father, we know that it's through your grace and your mercy that we uh, stand justified before you. And Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy. Bless us tonight as we leave. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.